So I just saw Dune Part 2, and it was good. I liked it. And a lot of the criticisms that I had with Dune Part 1 were very much improved for this film. I wound up re-watching Dune Part 1 in preparation for Dune Part 2, partially to see if my opinion would change on the first film, and partially because I just didn't remember that much of it. I know that people seem to really unanimously love the first film, but it really was not for me, and this was reaffirmed on my second watch. Now, I am a person that before Dune Part 1, I had not consumed any Dune-related media. I had not seen the David Lynch 1984 Dune, and I still haven't read the books. The biggest reason why I saw this film is because I'm a big fan of the director, Denis Villeneuve, or as some like to call him, Denis Villeneuve. He's a really great director, and I'm a big fan of Incendie, Prisoners, Enemy, Arrival, Blade Runner 2049, and Sicario is really good as well. There are still some things that I love about this film, and there are some really great and memorable scenes within it, but the overall experience of this film for me is kind of a chore to get through, even on my second watch. The total runtime of both of these films is about 5 hours and 20 minutes, and I honestly feel as though I would have enjoyed the entire experience more as a single 4-hour film. The fans of the original source material seem to really enjoy this film, so perhaps I would have gotten more out of the experience if I were more familiar with that, but as a newcomer it felt very repetitive and it was difficult to grasp onto anything in terms of both plot and characters. My second watch of this film made me realize just how much I really do not enjoy Timothée Chalamet in the lead role. I've heard from fans of the original material that they consider him to be very well cast for the role and he looks exactly how he's supposed to, but there's something about his overall screen presence and delivery that feels really phony to me. And this is coming from someone who thought he was absolutely fantastic in Call Me By Your Name. When I see him in this role, I just do not believe what he's saying. And this is especially detrimental to my experience when I'm trying to believe and get into this science fiction world that is presented. It also doesn't help that many of the effects in this first film are really unconvincing. I really applaud the efforts that went into trying to create a world that felt visually consistent. They went to great lengths ensuring that the lighting and color was cohesive to the universe, but at the end of the day, there's a significant amount of shots in this movie that feel artificial. When I'm trying to believe in this universe, it really doesn't help when there are shots that feel like a movie set or a green screen. It really doesn't help when there's computer animation that looks dated even for the time. I don't know if it was a budgetary issue or a time issue, but there are effects in this film that feel unfinished, and it never felt like this was the case in his film Blade Runner 2049 that came out four years earlier. Now, I've come to realize that this is very much a Star Wars-y type film, which makes sense because supposedly the original novel heavily inspired the original Star Wars films, but I am just very not interested in Star Wars. It's not my thing. Whatever floats your boat. If you love it, great. This is like a much better directed Star Wars type thing, basically. I was very bored and the movie made me very sleepy, even on a second watch. There are aspects to the story in this first film that felt poorly communicated, and perhaps it's because I'm not familiar with the source material, and perhaps it's just because of my lack of interest in general. I can really only take so much of the exact same tone for so long, where every single line from every single character character is delivered as if it's the most important thing ever said of all time. The tone of the film takes itself so incredibly seriously, despite being fairly goofy at points, and the Wonder Woman-esque parts of Hans Zimmer's score were really difficult to take seriously. <laughs> Anyway, like I said, there are still things that I very much appreciated about this film. I absolutely loved the sound design, it was super detailed and luscious. There are some aspects to this film that really work for me, but overall it is a very long and boring experience. So for my second watch of Dune Part 1, I have changed my rating from a 6 to a 5. Sorry everybody, 5 out of 10, just being honest. I am. I am just being honest. All right, now Dune Part 2 I saw in IMAX. It was a real IMAX, none of this fake IMAX bullshit. And despite this film being 10 minutes longer than Part 1, the flow and pacing of this film was very much improved for me. Part of this was helped by both the frequency and variety of memorable set pieces. It really felt like there were many more distinct and varied scenes in this film. The characters and their goals were much more clearly established and communicated. The film still had a very 
very strong sense of tone, but it didn't feel dependent on its tone for the experience. The overall look of this film was fantastic. It still had the same strong sense of visual consistency, but made even better by seamless special effects. Unlike the first film, the computer animation felt modern and polished throughout its entire runtime. All of these aspects combined really helped me to get lost in the universe and invested in the experience. And that's not to say that there was absolutely nothing that took me out of the film. For some reason, they cast Christopher Walken as the Emperor, and even though they tried their best to hide his Christopher Walken accent, there are some moments where it kind of poked through anyway, and especially with him being such a recognizable actor and such a consistent way of speaking over his whole career, it honestly felt kind of silly and distracting and really out of place in the universe. I understand the desire to make your cast as star-studded as possible, and with bigger budget films this is often the way that they get greenlit in the first place, but when I'm trying to absorb myself into a universe that is not the current day timeline that we're in right now, I'd honestly really rather have actors that are either less recognizable or much better at transforming themselves into other characters. The way that Austin Butler's character was portrayed, it felt like a genuine character in the universe. And even with Javier Bardem being really recognizable, his presence felt very complimentary to the setting. He's also another example of an actor that I've mostly ever heard him talk in a very specific particular way in most of his roles, but his accent in this film was not only different, but very consistent and well-performed. When the performances and character designs are well-realized enough, it helps to create what feels like a real character in the universe. And that unfortunately was not what Christopher Walken's presence in the film was. It just kind of felt like Christopher Walken was in the movie. There were people laughing in the theater when he was on screen in an otherwise completely silent screening of the film. It was very silly. It was very distracting. Didn't really work. Both Tim Cham and Zendaya's performances were notably better than the first film. And although not being able to completely separate their characters from their teen heartthrob type celebrity personas, their performances and characters were well realized enough that it wasn't distracting for me. I really enjoyed seeing their characters actually transform and develop over the runtime. Dave Batista's performance was, uh, fun. He was very loud and yelling all of his lines. And and uh, maybe this is just a me problem, but every single line he delivered, I was reminded of Tourette's dad. You motherfuckers! Go catch your dick! And uh, correction, apparently that was Tourette's guy, not Tourette's dad. I incorrectly remembered what he was called. Very old meme. Very old meme guy. Classic internet stuff. And uh, I also apologize to anyone who will now be thinking of Tourette's guy when they watch the film. I couldn't help myself. I found it funny. It was pretty entertaining to me. The music in this film was also way better than the first. They really dialed back on the Wonder Woman-esque parts of the soundtrack. And overall, the score was super complimentary and really helped the tone of the film. Still, despite this film being a pretty substantial improvement for me, it still feels as though there's a substantial chunk of the runtime that that just did not do anything for me. Again, my ideal version of these two films is just a trimmed down version of both of them together. And in that sense, I guess we wouldn't really keep all that much of part one. I enjoyed the overall experience of this film and there's a lot of talented filmmaking that went into it. I'm just not really all that sure how quickly I'm going to revisit this, especially with it being a part two to a film that makes me very sleepy. Much like the first film, I really loved the sound design and my favorite scene was probably the one where they are firing rockets behind moving cover. That one in particular was super well executed, and I'm glad that there are sequences from this film that are sticking with me in a positive way. There are scenes in this film that are actually epic, which is a very rare thing for me to experience despite how many films try to be. So yeah, check this one out, see it in IMAX if you can. This is a film that most people are bound to really love, and I'm giving this one a 7 out of 10. And because I was curious, I checked out David Lynch's Dune from 1984. And this was a funny film. It was honestly kind of fascinating seeing them tell essentially the same story as Dune Parts 1 and 2, but in one film that is under two and a half hours. There are some ways in which information was delivered more clearly, and some aspects to the story that were honestly a bit easier to understand in this version, but there were also just as many, if not more, aspects to this film that were confusing and poorly communicated. The overall filmmaking and directing in this film is not exactly exactly fantastic. There are some shots where characters are out of focus. There are some shots where characters are improperly miked. Music, then? No music. 
I'm packing this for the crossing. There are some practical effects in this film that look really interesting and charming. There are also some creature effects that look really cool, but there are also some really laughably bad effects that are very difficult to take seriously. The Roblox fight scene is very funny. <laughs> This is their take on the whole shield thing, a bunch of blocks. It's one of those things where even if you try to give it credit for the limitations of the time period in which the film was made, it still is not very well thought out at all. There's certain shots in these scenes where I honestly can't tell if characters are jumping or lunging or flying. It is really not clear based on how it's communicated visually. It is also very funny that Patrick Stewart explains how these shields work in the middle of his fight. The slow blade penetrates the shield. There's another really funny part at the beginning of this film where there's a narrator giving us a bunch of exposition uh, just staring at us into the camera in space. And after about a minute of this, she fades out and then says, oops, sorry, I forgot to tell you, and then fades back in. Oh yes. I forgot to tell you. Not a very good narrator. You were only talking for about a minute and you had to come back because you forgot to tell the audience something. Very funny. And uh, apparently David Lynch wrote the screenplay for this as well. That's pretty funny. I should also mention that the score for this film was honestly really great. The main theme that they played in a lot of the action scenes was quite a banger. <laughs> Kyle MacLachlan in the lead role was, uh, bad. He was very unconvincing throughout. He made a lot of funny faces. His chin was very distracting. It was like a second moon on his baby face. He does maybe one of the most unconvincing pretending to be asleep performances I've ever seen. Caracas, desert planet, moving. The character design in this film was also pretty funny. Here's a bunch of garbage bag people. There were some very crazy eyebrows in this movie. More than one character had crazy eyebrows. Not sure what that was about. It was pretty funny. The main villain was like a diseased Eggman from Sonic. He was my favorite character. He did a lot of yelling and maniacal laughing and flying around the room. <laughs> There's certain characters that use a translator, but you hear them speaking into it and, it and it sounds like David Lynch or someone doing a muffled dog growling sound. Harkonnens cannot stop him. Speaking of dogs, there's a bunch of pugs in the film for no reason. David Lynch likes pugs, I guess. I also love this guy in the background. Looks like he's hitting a vape, playing the kazoo, maybe. He's got the best expression on his face, and he's just standing there. He's the only thing you can see in the background. He really steals the scenery in this shot. The transition effects in this film are pretty insane. <laughs> And they do this quite a few times in the movie. Very bizarre choice. I love it. There's also a lot of body horror type stuff in this film. There's a good amount of blood, some very disturbing imagery throughout. There's a part where they rip the tongue off of a cow and the cow already has its hooves chopped off. And I don't know why this is in the movie. He just rips it off and eats it. Nom nom nom, mmm, delicious, nom, nom 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 nom. A lot of the film just looks really gross. They do a lot of uh, Fusro da Kamiyameya type stuff in the movie. <laughs> That's kind of funny. There's some really good lines in the film. I want to spit once on your head. Just some spittle in your face. There's a part where the people are like, we need to call you a name. And our main character says, what do you call the mouse shadow in the second moon? We call that one Muad'Dib. Could I be known as Paul Muad'Dib? You are Paul Muad'Dib. 
Sting is in the movie. He is very bad in the movie. Overall, this film was not boring. I was able to find a lot of entertainment value in how funny bad this film was. It was a fun little time capsule, and I don't regret watching it. Now, if I could just get a Dune film with the pacing of the David Lynch version, but the actual craftsmanship of the Villeneuve version, then my life would be perfect. Although, to be fair, there are definitely parts of this film that felt pretty rushed. The entire ending of this film honestly felt pretty anticlimactic. So yeah, there's definitely somewhere in between these two versions that I would prefer. And although this David Lynch film was definitely the worst version, I gotta say it was an absolute breeze getting through its runtime. So uh, yeah, check this one out. Maybe it was funny, and I'm giving this one a four out of ten. And uh, for those of you who haven't had enough Dune, I would highly recommend the documentary Hudorowski's Dune from 2013, a documentary about what could have been if director Alejandro Hudorowski was able to make his version. There's a review on my channel of this film somewhere. I have to run. I have to go. So check it out. I haven't seen it in probably a decade, but I gave it an eight out of ten. Thank you.